Thanks. Awesome. And uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Richard. We got Enzo here today with uh, in CatCam. And like advertised, we want to do a uh, live session here of an all Linux design together, talk about in CanCam a little bit. What does it do? What can we do with it? Uh, what's needed? Rodos, tools, etc. cetera. And um, I wanna, before Enzo has taken over, let you know if you're joining on the Zoom meeting, there is a link in the chat. If oh. you don't see it, let me know. And then I will um, repost oh. that, but you can basically, download a zip file there. And there's a little arrow on the top. Now you're gonna look at a whole bunch of files in the folder. The little arrow lets you zip everything and then download everything as a zip file. It is pretty big. I think it's 1.3 gigabyte or something, but I prepped um, a project where you can import into your CERML uh, database or ExoCAD database so that you can um, have the setup already correct in the database. And there's a bunch of scene files in there where I can follow along. So you don't have to necessarily then worry about not having the library or not having a certain module. You can still open the things and at least turn them around and, and look at them, et cetera. All right. So uh, let me know if you have trouble with the download or anything and or uh, any questions about that. And I'm, I'm going to give it over to Enzo and I'm going to make you the host here. All right. Yeah, I'm the host now. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Holly, for, for this opportunity for us. It's, uh, it's really important. Uh, just uh, out of curiosity for everybody that's here and everybody that's going to listen afterwards, uh, we started, I think the first license we've ever sold uh, on Inked Cam in the US was in the middle of uh, last year but we actually only started really working in the US in the beginning of this year with, uh, with Opulent. So having this opportunity to have this conversation to, so you guys understand what, what the solution is all about, what it can do for you, what it can do for your clinic. It's, uh, it's really important for us and uh, it's been amazing working with you guys. So um, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Enzo. I've been working, uh, my role here at, uh, at Inked Cam is uh, I'm head of sales and support teams. So pretty much you're gonna be, if uh, we start working together, you guys choose to go with Inked Cam, we're gonna, be, uh, we're gonna be talking to each other a lot. I think we have Dr. Pry here to say that. Uh, I think in the beginning, we were probably talking to each other possibly every day. So, let me go ahead and uh, I'll do a quick explanation of, uh, of what Inked Cam is, how, how it works, how it functions, how it, uh, it affects your day-to-day -day on, on the clinic. And then I'll give it up to Richard so he can go over a full case, which I think it's way more interesting to see uh, on a real case than only seeing me talking about it, being honest. Okay. So, all right. So first of all, we have this this note here that we always like to say is that uh, Inked Cam wants to provide you new possibilities, allowing your lab or clinic to increase its in-house milling capacities. Why do we say that? Um, so you guys know Inked Cam was, is a Brazilian based company. So it was created here in Brazil back in 2013, 2014. It was a development in partnership between the distributor and Amon Gearbuck at the time. All right. And this development was to allow labs basically to mill direct to fixture constructions. Right. So that's the main idea. So direct to MUA's constructions, direct to implant construction, direct to hex constructions. Right. And how does Inked Cam work? How it, uh, how it functions right? how it does that. Inked Cam is a milling strategy that activates a kit of special burrs, special tools. I don't know how you guys call them. Those burrs, the difference between those burrs and the regular burrs from, uh, from Amon Gearbuck is that the regular ones, they have round top burrs. So they kind of look like my finger here. They have round top burrs. While when you go with, uh, with, um, with Inked Cam's burrs, they have flat tops, right? 
And if you start to think a little bit on the milling process of what's the importance of working with flat burrs uh, and working with round top burrs is think about every 90 degree angle, every flat corner, that uh, sharp, ed sharp edge, flat corner. I don't know what's the correct word, but I think you guys get what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. Um, think of the difference that, that you're going to have on those connections, all on those uh, fittings. If you, have, if you try to do it with a round top burr and not a flat one. And also what we do, what we do is uh, we offer specially designed libraries that have the STL of a scan body. So you can mill the scan body in-house. Now that you're able to mill direct to fix, fixture constructions, you can mill the scan body and then use that scan body to scan the case and then design using the same library. And uh, the case Richard's gonna show us, it was done exactly using that. So it's uh, it was a scan body milled, I think it was in Sintron. It was either in Sintron or in Peak. And then later the whole case was designed on top of it. All right, so um, just going over real quick, we work with two different types of, uh, of scan bodies here. We work with uh, intraoral and extraoral scan bodies. The main difference is that all of them, the both ones are gonna have the scan body file, the implant library, but only the intro or one is gonna have the digital analog file. So when you print the model, right? So when you 3D print the model, you're gonna have the placement for the, for the implant already, right? One thing that's really uh, that's really important to mention is that uh, okay, we do offer a, a quite a big uh, portfolio. I think it is of uh, different libraries. But if you guys uh, happen to use one library that we haven't yet developed and you want to use, and that's one case that we're doing with Dr. Pryor that is here with us today, um, you guys can send us the analog, the screw and the abutment, and we will develop a library exclusively for you. One other thing, excuse me. One other thing that's really important is that um, we saw that in the US, it's really common to use different types of screws, especially the Rosen screws and the Powerball screw, right? So what we also can do is we can customize our libraries for you. So let's say just as an example, you're using a MUA library from Noba, right? The, I think it's the most standard one out there. And uh, you wanna use a different type of screw. And um, you have two options. You can either send us the screw or you can send us the measurements of that screw. And we will customize the library according to that need, right? That's really cool. Just to give you guys an idea, these are some of the brands that we have libraries compatible with. With So I think I'm just gonna name some here, but I think you guys got the idea. So we have Strawman, uh, we have Miss, Zimmer, uh, BioHorizons. We have a bunch. I think we are over 250 different libraries developed. But again, the important thing to understand is if you guys don't find the ones you need on our list, we can develop new ones for you. Um, where can our libraries be used? Um, they can be used on Ceramil Mind, Exocan, Three Shape, and Dental Wings. Okay. Of course, <clears throat> this is the, the order that they're going to function better, right? So you have, you're going to have more options on Mind than on Exocad, then on Three Shape, and then on Dental Wings. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, what are these options, what I mean by these options in a little bit, right? Talking about the burrs now. So you're gonna have to work with three different burrs to be able to do, to be able to use in CAD CAM. So you're gonna have a 0 0.6 millimeter flat top, as you guys can see here. You're gonna have a 1.2 millimeter flat top, and you're gonna have a 1.5 T shape. The 0 0.6 is the bird that's gonna mill only the connection, right? The 1.2 is the one that's gonna mill the screw channel from the top. And the 1.5 T-shape is the one that you're gonna use if you have angled screw channels, right? So if you wanna do an angled screw channel direct to MUA without using those uh, angled abutments, 
if you want to do the, the let's say the zirconia structure with the angle channel you're going to have to uh, you're going to use the 1.5 t-shape all right and talking a little bit more about those angle channels and this is really important to get it clear to everybody here for now to be able to design and mill angled screw channels you have to have three things number one the 1.5 t-shaped burr number two ceramic mind not exocad not three shape not dental wings ceramic mind and version of uh, the ceramic software version 3.14 or above which is pretty much i think everybody is uh, it's over that version right now not going to waste too much time here but um those burrs are placed if you, if you don't have a medic, which does the, the whole burst management and you have a motion two, a micro five axis or any other machine, I'm not gonna waste too much time here, but just know that they are installed in addition to the ones that you guys already have, right? One thing that I forgot to mention, all those burrs you guys can purchase with Oculent, right? So those are Ceramil burrs. So they are burrs uh, with the Amon Gearbuck brand on them and you can purchase them directly with Oculent. And here is where I, I really like you guys to understand what's the difference on the milling of working without, with and without in CAD CAM here. So we took on this case here, exactly the same STL file, right? So this is exactly the same design. We milled in the same material. We did the whole process exactly the same. The only difference is that the one on top was done without in CAD CAM, meaning with the strategy, the standard strategy from Amon Gearbuck. And the one on the bottom was done using in CAD CAM, right? And I want you guys to take a look on everywhere that was supposed to have a sharp edge, a 90 degree angle, right? So you have on top here, as you were milling using a flat burr, you're always gonna have this radius here. You're always gonna have these gaps here on an interface between the, the implant and the component, the uh, abutment, let's call it here. And also, which is really, really important on the screw seating here, right? And you guys can already start to think of, of what's the problem of work, what are the problems of working like that? You're gonna have bed fitting, bed fitting, micro movements, micro movements, fracture, patient coming back, right? While if you work, Within CAD CAM, as you're using the flat bars, you're gonna have these types of connections. So you have the perfect fit. You have the uh, you have what it takes to have a good fitting. So you see that the gaps don't exist neither on the interface here nor on the screw sitting here. Uh, Dr. Pryor, we were talking about hex connections, right? So uh, this is again. Same STL, same process, same the whole thing. The only difference is that the one on the right here uses inked cam and the one on the left here does not use it. And I think the, the, the picture here speaks for itself. So on the left here, you have the, I don't know how to call this shape, but this is not a hex at all. While on the, on the right using inked cam, you have the perfect corners, you have the perfect fitting, you know what the difference is gonna be on the patient's mouth here. Uh, where can Inkit can be used? Uh, as it was a development in partnership with Amon Gearbuck back then, it can be used on any AG mill. So if you have a Motion 2, a Matic, a Micro 4X, a Micro 5, now the Motion two, motion 3, the Motion 2 Dry, it's going to work on all of AG's equipment. What are the requirements that you guys have to have to work with Inkit Cam? Ceramil Match 2 and the protection plan from a mom and gearbox valid. Okay, so those are the two requirements for you to be able to have Inked Cam on your system. Inked Cam is activated on the dongle, right? So let's say you are a huge clinic and for some reasons you have, I don't know, 10 medics, but you have only one dongle controlling all those medics, you only need one activation, okay? What materials can be milled within CAD CAM? I know Cintron is not really popular in the US, but it's a good option for metal. Zirconia, peak, wax, and PMMA for now, okay? 
in summary, what is possible to do within CAD-CAM, right? So you will be able to produce customized abutments or which is really, really common in the US and what I've seen people are really looking for when they go ahead and you know, choose to go within CAD-CAM is that it can mill direct to MUA connections without using the tie bases, okay? You can also mill your own scan bodies if you're doing a lot of intraoral scans or if you're doing impressions, plaster model, and then digital, digitalizing, those are two, uh, this is also a good option for you to go digital. And of course, mill angled screw channels, right? Not gonna waste too much time here because this is gonna be Richard talking a lot, but uh, the workflow of using Inked Cam, very first step, milling the scan body, scanning the case, of course, um, designing the case, Doing the nesting, and here is where you choose the strategy. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Richard's going to cover that. And uh, milling and sintering afterwards. Let me just go ahead and show you some examples, right? So, this guy here is a, this is not a multi unit connection, but I, I don't know what connection this is. But the important thing is, it is a solid gen axis structure over four implants metal free structure, right? So no tie bases used here. This is direct to implant or direct to MUAs, let's call it connection. Um, this is another case really common that uh, what we've been seeing people doing over there in the US. So this is a all on one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, an all on five type of case in uh, Zirconia Solid HT+. This is a really old case, so that's why you see this, uh, this stabilizer here. This is really old. I think this is from 2016. But you get the idea. Again, metal-free structure, no tie bases, direct to MUAs. One more case, over eight implants, no tie bases. You get the idea. Again, all on four, no tie bases, Solid HT plus white. Why am I saying a lot about, uh, am I talking a lot about the zirconius usage? You cannot expect to use, for example, a solid FX multilayer and have the resistance, resistance necessary to mill a direct construction, right? You have to use more structural zirconius. Is that right, Richard? Is that, a, is that the word? A stronger one, yeah, higher, higher megapascal. The yeah. FX is only 700 megapascal and you, you probably want something like the HD plus or the Gen X. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So always choose to go with more with uh, with strong, stronger zirconias for those types of cases. The Zala Gen X, being honest, is a really good option because it, it is already multi-layer. It's kind of a hybrid there. Um, this is using Sintrum. Not going to waste too much time here, but this is an internal connection in Sintrum, which is a pre-sintered chromium cobalt alloy. I think I said it right. Yeah. Um, these guys here are angled screw channels, just so you guys understand what, what, what I said about it. So you kind of can see directly to the hex connection, but this again could be over in MUA. Sintron bar, metal bar here, right? For now, only in Sintron. Uh, the metal option is Sintron or wax, which I don't think anybody here is doing uh, wax and casting anymore. Is it? I don't know, probably not. This picture is really nice. Uh, not, on, not to show the, uh, uh, the point here is not to show the material, is not to show Sintrum or not to, is to show the fitting you get, right? So you see the fitting you can get here. Of course, this we're talking about good and new sets of burrs, good machine, good calibration, good maintenance, good service and experience users, right? So this, this combo, if you have this combo, this is what you can expect when using Inked Cam plus Amon Gearbox. And that's really nice. Uh, this is one really famous case that we always show. Um, Sintron bar on the bottom, Zirconia superstructure, structure, superstructure, I don't know how to call it. Cement one, one on top of the other. And here you see all the connections here done using Inked Cam, right? So the point here again is to show the connections. Final case, just so you guys see the, the aesthetics of it. We talked a lot about hacks and MUA connections, but I just want to show that it is possible to mill a whole range of different implants connections, right? If I'm not mistaken, this is PMMA. 
But for those types of connections, getting back to what we were talking before, I wouldn't go for zirconia, those only in metal, right? Being 100% honest here. Again, the fitting, so you guys can take a look. Um, this is one other option that we, we don't see a lot, but we see some people doing a whole structure done in peak. You can see it on the top here without, again, metal free structure. So you don't have the, you don't have uh, tie bases, uh, tie bases or titanium abutments. I don't know how you guys call them. And you have those solid effects, uh, multi-layer crowns on top here, right? Um, just to give you guys an idea of where we are right now, uh, we just started in the US, but uh, we've been working since um, 2014. We are today with uh, over, actually over a thousand customers in over 50 different countries with over six different distributors around the world. So we've been doing this for a while, while always alongside with AG this whole time, right? Um, Richard, I think I, that's the whole presentation. If you want to take it from here, go for it, man. Sure, maybe you make me the host. Um, I don't know if I want to do that actually. What now? I don't know if I want to do that, actually. <laughs> How do I make you host here? Uh, um, I think you click on my three dots and then you can... Oh, yeah, there you are. Make host. Yes, there you go. Awesome. And I will share my screen as well. And um, I'm just going to repeat. Uh, there is a link in the, in the chat window here on the Zoom call. Uh, or if you want it on a later point, if you're now watching on Facebook Live or something uh, and you want the data set, then uh, just let me know. Shoot me an email, richard at uplandcatcam.com. And I'll, I'll send you the link over and you can download everything. Um, and it's basically a folder, which I'm pretty sure that you know how that works, but I'm going to show it anyways. You would say load. And you would then say exocab projects, right? Um, sure, save it. And then you can browse to wherever you downloaded your folder to, right? And it will only show you the dental project files. So all the mess of files, what I created in that folder will be hidden. You will only see one file. You double click it or say open, and then it imports it into your database. You may have to select a laboratory. You can just say default laboratory or call it Opulent or whatever you want to call it. And um, then you should be able to see pretty much exactly this on the screen, um, what I now have in front of me. The original case looked a little bit different. I wanna show you um, what's in the folder and I wanna show you what the goal here is. Um, if you're looking in here, there's a whole bunch of scene files in here, which I numbered that they're in order. So even if it's now, I don't know if it's blurred on the screen or something. If you're looking at the actual folder, you see in CatCam RJ01 and then RJ02 and so on. So that there are certain steps in the design. If, if you are now following along maybe and you get um, to maybe not finish what you wanted to do or just look right or whatever, you can just then on a certain step, uh, load the next scene file and you're back on track. Okay, and then you can still follow the steps or uh, let's say you don't have the InCAD-CAM library now and, and how are you going to match the scan bodies now? The first one actually already has the scan bodies matched, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, what is a little bit different in here, um, and that will be in the screenshots, um, is that the, I changed the project up a little bit and I have to find it. It actually will be in here somewhere. Hold well on. Um, I will show you the original one. I, actually, let me just explain it. Here, you, if you're looking at number four, number 13, I said there to omit them in the bridge design because the cantilever, depending on where the implants are, um, shouldn't get too long because otherwise you're risking that something's going to fracture, etc. So I, I fixed that in, in this setup here for you. So if you were clicking on design and start this whole thing from scratch, it's going to omit those and uh, your cantilever is going to be shorter. And just for fun, you could basically go through this. 
and <clears throat> in the scene files that wasn't the case yeah so you will then see in the scene file that can't lever is uh, debatable <laughs> it's probably too long um but let's go and click on design and the first scene file what we're loading is basically where the scan bodies are already matched um, we need how Enzo was already saying a library for this um, that library is provided from in CatCam. they will make a team viewer they will place it on your computer it's a two-part library so you have an implant library and you have a model builder library and they will put it for you on the right place um, it should be should be fairly straightforward and easy goes together with the activation of the of the license so let's open that scan marker aligned and if you have questions feel free to to type them in the chat if you're on the zoom we should we should see them if you're now on facebook or something i i will take a look uh, afterwards um Everything what's coming in through Zoom, uh, we will have a Q&A at the end. Okay, so what we're looking here is basically, let me hide the, um, with the A button, you can see here what I'm, what I'm doing, if I'm holding control or whatever I'm doing. Um, we can take a look at where the scan bodies are. Like Enzo was already saying, those were milled, probably been a PMMA, I would assume. And uh, to be here fully, fair and full disclosure if I'm hiding the scan data you can see there was actually an implant which hasn't integrated yeah so we changed the scan data here a little bit um, as if there was another bone graft done uh, the implant was taken out and everything has healed up again okay and then if you're looking at the at the positions of the implants uh, sometimes they are placed a little bit more posterior, which maybe would have helped the case. And then this end for sure gets too long. Um, so I would have probably reduced the cantilever on that then if, if uh, we weren't just designing that for fun right now. Okay. And what are the goals actually? Let me uh, go Richard, back. Richard, may I, may I just real quick? Yeah, sure. Um, you said um, you talked about the scan bodies being milled, right? Yep. One thing that's really, really important whenever you mill out a scan body, every scan body design has a certain height, right? So let's say 10 millimeters, 11 millimeters, whatever. Each implant library is going to have its, uh, its own size. It's really important to measure out the scan body's height before you use it, right? Because if it's too off the established one, when you scan it, and then when you're going to try to do the matching of the, when you import the library and you're going to do the matching, it's going to have a different in height and you're not going to get the connection you need. Just wanted to put that out there. Okay, interesting. All right. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, which reminds me also, um, when um, I forgot to mention that, then I got sidetracked like with becoming the host and everything. When you said that all the AG mills are supported, um, I wanted to add that, of course, for the full arch cases, you want to have a 5X machine. So the 4X machines, which are supported for in CAD-CAM, you can still do singles. Uh, and uh, you should, I guess, also be able to do an angled screw channel on a single with a 4X, I would, uh, but I'm actually not sure. You might already, you can maybe answer that better, Enzo. You might already need the 5X for that. Um, if it's just a straight screw channel, uh, you should be able to do it. Um, and exactly. On, uh, a straight screw channel, it's going to do it on a 4X, but if you're doing angled screw channels, only on a 5X. And for full arch cases like this, definitely. Or for any implant bridge, I should say, you need a 5X as well. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a little bit on, on what I'm trying to, to show you here. So we're, we're obviously going to make a scan body matching. Um, we are picking a tooth library in this case this is the um we turn the, the keys off here it's annoying in this case this is the uh, exofan library i ended up and i want to show you that how i did that uh there is a pre-op in here and i ended up um running the articulator on on the pre-op because that's something what the patient has been walking around for maybe 10 years it looks like a really worn down denture maybe it's not 10 years but for a long time 
um, and what the patient's used to. And I think those things are super important to have. The more information you can get, the better. Um, in those big cases, I would probably even suggest, hey, let's do a Facebook because it takes two minutes, maybe three minutes to do that. Uh, and you're already getting more information with this. Um, if there is, I don't know, if there's a can to it, uh, et cetera, where it's in position uh, to the condyles and then in your articulator, the, the whole movement pattern will change with it. Uh, nowadays, we can even do the zebras, which is all digital Facebook. So it takes the same amount of time and you could even get the, the recording of the dynamics uh, of those movements um, and import that into your SAML software or ExoCAD to uh, not even having to program the articulator anymore, et cetera. So I would, I would take the information what you can get. In my case, I didn't have access to, to that here. So I basically ran it on top of the, the pre-op to at least get a, a basic uh, map of, of what the, the, the interior guidance is. And then I, I set up and I built this, um, try to build up and, and reestablish a canine guidance, you know? and then cut everything off dynamically. And then basically now we're looking at, at something where there's, this is the dynamics where, where it's discluding um, with uh, the canine guidance. And um, we're making a cutback. It's up to you if you're making a prototype, of course you don't want to do that, but you, uh, in this case, assuming that this is a, a full arch zirconia where you maybe want to do some micro layering on it. Okay, then after the cutback, we're going to freeform that and smoothen that a little bit out. And we uh, have eventually something more or less looking like this. We have a tissue design, of course, and then ultimately we're trying to get the smallest possible footprint on the gingiva to not have um, any dirt or any, any stuff underneath because the patient can take it out, right? We all know that uh, the patient needs to come in, get that uh, taken out every once in a while and get that cleaned. And uh, the smaller the footprint to the tissue is, the, the less can get trapped under there. Uh, of course, if you're looking here at the outline, you have to see where the implants are and you have to hold a minimum thickness around your implants, otherwise the whole thing would break, right? Um, so it's a, you're trying to do the smallest footprint whilst being still uh, in a thickness that is, that is doable. And then ultimately we are looking somewhat like, like that. And to maybe at the end freeform things to make sure that the, the implant minimum thickness is there, what I already said. And then here you see that this would be a total dirt trap and mess. Um, and the same here, this would be an issue um, with the, would not be very hygienic. So you wanna freeform this and you wanna reduce the footprint and uh, to be honest, at the final design, if you're looking at the final, I probably, once this is milled, uh, still take a bird to this and, and try to reduce the footprint even more uh, on, the, on the gingiva design. Uh, but you see here where it's, where it's touching and, and we're trying to keep this at a, at a minimum. And ultimately look in something like that. The screw channels on this case, not really required. So we're gonna end up turning them off. And so uh, it's still gonna make the screw access hole. It's just a, what we're turning off here is actually the screw hole design or the chimney, how I would call it, which is really more relevant if you would have a cutback there. If you're not keeping this in full contour, if you're cutting back on, the, on, on that tooth here, um, you, would, you would basically make a chimney so you can stack your porcelain around it. That's, that's the point of it, but that's not required. And if we're looking at that, uh, at that from the bottom, you can see how um, everything is milled in, in direct connection. And uh, for zirconia, uh, you wanna try to avoid things like, like these, um, or in, in zirconia, when you're milling it, you might actually get away with those, but uh, in your design, the cleaner you're designing this, the, the better. Um, if you're printing this, the printer will definitely replicate that if that was your prototype. Yeah, so you have to fix that later in, in uh, some point otherwise. Okay, so let's get back into the case. We don't really need to edit this anymore. So we can 
basically load the library key there. Let's see, load custom model key. Exofan, that's actually already the correct one. And there is a chain mode, of course, where we can get everything roughly placed. And I usually go back and forth in between single and or even the simple mode to correct where the teeth are and then go back to the chain mode, okay? And if we're looking at our reference, the reference will give us an idea where we, where we have to more or less be. So we can basically take everything approximately individually or in the chain mode. Oops, not the single chain. Get this over here, move things where they Long and with simple mode and roughly place things and resize them. And then look at what needs to actually be fixed. What I didn't do at this point is I didn't ran the articulator, so I will come back to this and load this on the articulate and show you what I did with the, with the pre-op here. Okay. And then if we go to back to chain mode, it puts it back together, but keeps kind of the position a little bit better. Yeah. So I, I go, I try to go back and, and forth. You can resize them. And if you do that for the chain, you're doing that for all of them. And then you can basically, um, try to get them close. And that's also why I prepared those scene files so that you don't have to painfully watch me here trying to get everything in place and then we can jump on to the next scene file and uh, see how I prepared that there. But I wanna show you the um, uh, articulator. So I'm going to go into export mode here for a moment. Tools, articulator. And what we would have to do is, is, is first position it, right? So let's get rid of the, um, let me turn the keys on because I, I use the keys. So I just hit um, E, which turns on and off the anatomy, okay, or S for scan data, et cetera. So you can see it on the bottom now, what I'm actually doing. Get the antagonist back on here, and we are gonna place it with the reference and place it out here for a moment, automatically set in size at point. And then it jumped here to set on patient's left molar, so we can do that. And then on the right molar, do that, perform alignment, and it should be on its place. So if you have a, a face bow, et cetera, that position might be different, that might be helpful. And then the table selection is, is maybe something you wanna keep an eye out for because if you're trying to reestablish a canine guidance, then you maybe want to use this, or you want to trace what the pre-op was um, to basically see what the patient previously had. If if I was to try to trace the pre-op, I would basically do this um, with a different articulator. I would use the flat table then. I'm going to leave the gap here because, well, we need that. <laughs> And I'm going to switch over to the flat table. Still leave the gap. And here's a button, choose which teeth influence the articulator movement. And I know there's people, they don't, they don't load that on an articulator. Um, and if, if you're able to do this without an articulator and you have good results, 
kudos to you. Um, um, I applaud you. I, for me, I need to load it on an articulator. Um, and I will say here, by teeth. Uh, sorry, not by teeth, by... Ah, I don't have it as a... I don't have it loaded as a pre-op scan. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, I have to actually add this as a pre-op scan. I don't know why this is not in the scene file. That's my preparation wasn't the, the best here, I guess. Um, interesting. Add remove mesh, let's do that really quick. Re up scan, load. Should have been in there. I'm confused why it's not. It's the this one. Okay. Do that one more time. I think I did the wrong button because it was aligned perfectly a second ago. There, yep, perfect. So back to my articulator. Inside the point, pre up in here. There. Smaller and the right molar perform alignment. Okay. And the Altex that table. Leave the gap and choose which teeth influence articular movement. And then now we have by scan. And we can enable the pre op scan, can apply this. And um, I did actually freeform the pre op here and change the intersections and, and uh, eliminated the intersections which are in between here. I'm not going to go through all uh, that right now, but I'm going to show you how you can basically uh, run the articulator now and it should be, you see what's happening with the incisal pin, considering the pre-op. So now you get a, you get a baseline from it. Okay, once we say okay, it will now allow us to repeat those movements. And those are the movements what the patient had before, okay? And what the patient was hopefully uh, happy with. And the, the VOD was established um, and the midline was established. And this, this pre-up tells us already a lot of information. Um, then I'm gonna, jump and load the next scene file where the teeth are already placed a little bit better. So if you're following along, you can basically close that, go to design, and then we're loading the number two. The teeth are set up and it's the placement step. And you're basically trying to just get them in a, in a, 
first and, and rough position, I would, I would say. And I actually carried over the, uh, the neck sticking out a little bit too far uh, for a long time in the design process, but it doesn't matter. We have like three, four times the ability to free form where we can grab them and, uh, and then basically change that. So the, the very first setup, I'm really just looking at the, the size, the position, and compared to the pre-op, um, where, where we are roughly. Okay. And then once there, I'm going to jump to the next one now, just to save us a little bit of time. And not bore you guys to death. Well, we're adapting the occlusion. So I skipped the three, I loaded the number four with the, the teeth on the, on the final position. I changed basically the, the length of them. There is a, a great symmetry tool, um, but this is probably the, the portion which takes the longest time to find something, what, what you like, what you can think of the patient's gonna look like. Um, Pictures do help, face scan would help. You know, all those are, are uh, good things to, to have somehow. And when we're looking at the, uh, at the occlusion now, if I go to up here, I usually like to be on show contacts. If I turn the dynamics off, turn the antagonist off for a second, we have a bunch of intersections here right now. So if we were going to adapt, and we were to adapt the occlusion and cut those intersections away. If you, that's why I see a lot of people are doing, but the, sorry, I actually meant to cut this static. I see a lot of people just cut without the articulator, but then none of the movements are, are considered. And then you're maybe creating a, a, a canine guidance or an anterior guidance, which uh, the patient can tolerate or would, would end up not, not working out. Um, so what, what I basically did here is I ended up um, cutting this dynamic like this, and then going back into the, the free forming here and with the add remove tool now, taking contacts off what I don't want to have, maybe on the cantilever here, reducing contacts in the posterior region on that, on that molar here, same on this side. And so just make this a little bit lighter in, in the occlusion and building up the, the canine. And in order to do that, basically, Removing those and then adding adding canine guidance back in here so that I have the room when it's guiding over the canines that I get a disclusion on my anteriors. Okay, so I end up loading the uh, articulator a couple of times. So at this point, um, this is a rough example that you can hopefully follow my steps. I would basically go back into expert and I would go back to tools and then run the articulator another time so that we can choose which teeth influence articulator movement one more time. And then this time we can say mark teeth by click, complete tooth, and hold shift, click on the canine, click on the other canine, say okay. And now those canines, what you're building up are guiding, okay? And since I just freeform them and we're starting this, this should give us room in the anterior region what we eventually need to design the case. All right. 
And if we're looking at this now, that should be pretty much the result because it's guiding through through those. All right. So fast forward because I only roughly made this. I'm going to close this down, load my next scene file. And we're coming back on track here. Yes, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock and it's 4.52 and I don't, I know we, we all have some other places to go here at some point. Uh, Richard, I think we lost your audio. You did? Oh, no, no. There it is. There it is. Sorry. Okay. Awesome. Okay. And if you're looking now, this looks this looks already a bunch um, better. Yeah? And we're again in a free forming. So it, it's just a constant uh, changing this. And at some point, I took two parts to basically... I was shift and mouse wheel click to drag them through here to get the next um, further in so that I have more room and, and not that this uh, big footprint of the gingiva. Uh, we, we don't want any flanges created here, which are dirt trap. Like I said, small footprint. Yeah. And I think at, at this point here in that scene file, I haven't lightened those contacts up, but uh, I did at a later point. Um, and then at some point, let's see what we're having in the next step here. That's the adaptation again. We basically already covered that. And uh, we are not adapting to this pre-op. We are only using it as a guidance. And then uh, we're coming to the cutback. Um, I think this question just also popped up from somebody. Some of the libraries are supporting um, what's called a thimble design. Um, this library, the Exofan library, which comes with Exocad, does support it. If you're using Ceramil, it would be the Knut Miller library, which has the thimbles in them. And um, as long as you're using one of those libraries, which has the thimbles in it, you could also um, make this a, a, a peak substructure and then basically make zirconia crowns on top of this. Uh, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to I'm going to say the uh, the normal reduction, and I'm going to say here exclude selected parts. And again, that's just me. Um, if you are using uh, Ceramil and you have the Knut Mill library, it already comes with a nice cutback library. Um, you would then be able to save the step what I'm actually showing right now. But this is kind of like the before the cutback libraries were out there. Uh, you would say mock all. And then you would go in here with a brush, holding down the shift key and making the cutback however you want to make the cutback. Um, Unfortunately, in this step here, there is no symmetry tool. That would actually be really helpful if there was one. Um, but there, there isn't in this step. And then you can you can paint whatever sort of flames, mamelons on here, however you want to design those. Yeah, and then I'm only going to show this on these two here, and then I'm going to skip ahead again to the next scene file. But once I say apply. The standard of 0.8 is probably a little too much. Okay, if you're doing a micro layering, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 is probably enough. And if you go to the next step, there's yet again a free forming. <laughs> there's plenty of free forming steps in the wizard. And then basically in here, I can go in with the point of knife no sharp edges you're gonna you're gonna see the transition when you're when you're micro layering there Let me turn the keys off here for a second and what i also use quite a bit is tools and just light i have a little bit of a lag here it seems like 
Yeah, so we were smoothing all of this off. Maybe removing some more. And cleaning this up. Sometimes I make even like horizontal lines on there. It's that's up to you. Um, you can make a really rough cutback, and then you can use your your handpiece and and use a, a diamond. You just have to be really careful once it's once it's cut out uh, that there's no vibration on it. Sometimes the especially if you're using a new diamond, uh, put them on a stone or something that they that they are running really round. Um, otherwise, it, it might hammer into your zirconia somehow, and you might get some cracks in there. It's an arm. Okay, let's jump to the next one. So we have reforming of the cutback. I just showed that. And um, if you're following along on this on the scene files, this case was actually set up in the beginning with gingiva design uh, not part of the wizard step um, and in expert mode. So uh, the scene file actually I, I called it that. Don't create the wax up. Um, instead, go to export mode and, and create your change of our design. Um, here's the, the connectors. I want to talk about the connectors here for a brief second. I showed you in the beginning the, um, the screenshots of um, the, the little gap what we had here in, 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 the, in between the centrals and somewhere on the posterior end. The connectors would help you preventing that. It's usually quite common that your uh, either directly connect them here or that that there's even an X here. The X is not here because I haven't made the change of our design. Otherwise, I would actually see an X here. Um, X means there's no connector whatsoever because the change of our ultimately connects everything. But if you're doing that, if you're skipping the connector design, then you need to make sure that they're together and that there's no gaps in between your papillas and et cetera. Okay, that's the only thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out on that. So I'll go to export mode at this step uh, and not have any connectors. That's okay. And go to Jinjua based design here. And if, if you're loading or designing the case from scratch, how I gave you the project, um, it's already marked that the Jinjua design is part of the, the wizard steps here. Okay, and what you're doing now is you're basically just tracing it. And I don't know if you saw a moment ago, the next were already pulled in. I don't know why it does that. Um, I'm basically kind of ignoring that because I, I already know and we, we can change it in a moment as well, but I already know that I pulled those necks in. And you're trying to basically stay on top of the ridge, more or less, so that you're not um, creating flanges and dirt traps. But of course, you got to cover somehow your implants that the minimum thickness for those is there. Okay, you see the change was being created. And we can fine tune that from here as well change it, pull this a little back. And you don't necessarily have to worry a ton about this right now because you can freeform this later. And I do a lot in the freeforming again, that's maybe just my personal preference. But if I design this a little bit too long, you can uncheck the box that it, that it keeps that edge in place 
and, and you can just take this off. Um, so if I were to, to say apply, it's going to make my changes. I don't know what I did here. Once this is calculated, I can, I think, get rid of this. There. Um, and you can, you can specify what your base thickness and what everything is supposed to be. Usually the defaults are, are pretty okay to work with, and it's ultimately is up to you <laughs> how, um, Think you want to design it. Um, and if I now open the wizard again, we can now see that acts what I was talking about. Uh, so I could say, no, don't create any connectors whatsoever. Then you just have to make sure that those, those things are closed. Or we can say the plus and apply that because then at least it's going to. It's going to make a direct connection somewhere. Or you could you could place whatever uh, connector shape in there, but it's usually it's easier just pulling them together a little bit. Um, once we go to the next step, we're now in the free forming of the Jinjua, and we can say keep bottom on the boundary fixed. We can uncheck that because otherwise if I try to, to grab this edge, it's not going to allow me doing that. But if I uncheck that, it's basically letting me, maybe should <laughs> let me grab this edge, there you go, and, and move that. And if I say huge region, then I can make this, this whole thing a little shorter here. And I do a lot with, if you uncheck this, oop, I think it just crashed on me. See, that's why I, I also made the scene files in case something like this would happen. Unfortunately, as, as great as Exocad is, it uh, sometimes does crash. <clears throat> the CRM software is so safe often on cases like that. I think we've all been there. Um, you had a couple hours in the design and suddenly the thing crashes. So. Um, Maybe not as extensive as I save now with like 12 of them. That's an overkill yeah, for your normal workflow. Um, but you wanna, you do wanna save. Okay, so let me show you the freeform Jinjua, below that one, and, and maybe a couple of tricks on how I'm, how I'm getting to the Jinjua design, how I like it. So um, one little trick I can tell you is um, I, I like to use the, the Wacom's. So you got a little pen, uh, it's just a little tablet and you can, instead of having to work with the mouse, I can basically use that, okay? So, and I can, you can use both. Um, and I, for free forming changes, I, I do like it. So if you're going to the, small area here, or I, I use that quite a bit. And you end up using the pen. It, it just feels a little bit more natural, okay? And you're, you're getting to a quick result, but whether or not you have it doesn't really matter. If, um, if you make a V in here, roughly like this, and I'm overdoing this now, yeah, because I already done that. But that's, the, that's the, the process of it, that I'm making a V in here. And after that, um, smoothing over this again. And I, I actually don't go in between smooth and flattening and, and remove. I just hold shift and control, which is the same thing. Maybe a lower strength here, and then smoothing over this. And that leaves you usually with, a, now in this case, a little overdone, but if you're looking at this side, with a decent papilla reformed uh, the frenum in here. And then um, if you want a little bit of a, a texture in here, you can make this um, knife, point of knife really small and a relatively high strength. 
hold down the shift key and go over this and it, it will make those little holes in here. Go back to your brush, hold down control and smoothen basically just with the control key over this. Um, and then you have some texture. Whether or not the mill is gonna fully replicate that, maybe not, but if you're printing something like this, um, you get some areas which are not perfectly even, and that's, I guess, usually what you're, what you're after. And you're, you're saving a little bit of time with, uh, with your hand piece. Okay, next one. Actually, hold on. Let's look at the underside. I wanted to show that. At this point, the underside is not um, adapted. So let's go and do that together here. Um, skip over this, the connectors. It's creating everything as a wax up. So it's merging the crowns and the tissue together. And we should be able to freeform this at the end again. And if you if you adapt to the to the tissue, it's basically you have to freeform the underside again in order to take care of those dirt traps, which could happen to fill in the material where it's needed. Um, and you have to find a good balancing act in and what is too much or what's too little. Um, Everything round, ideally, no sharp edges. You want to smoothen over everything, which is which is sharp looking, definitely. And especially around the the implant connections, there's usually some material missing what you need to fill in somehow. And in my case, and uh, maybe that would have been yes, it's definitely worth, worth mentioning because I already made the uh, the, the scene files. It will ask you for an emergence profile design at some point eventually. I usually don't even make that. I, I just say next in the result. And what that will end up being is that the emergence profile is just around your, your MUA. Okay. And then what that basically does is that everything else is, is then considered tissue. So you, you have your normal free forming tools where I find it sometimes a little tedious if you make a emergence profile design, uh, you're limited to the, to the free-forming tools from that emergence profile design, and they're not always great. And then I have to go into export mode and uh, say free-form emergence profile. Uh, so I, I can I, that's how I do it here. So I don't have to go into export mode. I can just free-form the whole thing. And if we're looking at this now, basically hiding the, the scan data, you can, you can see what I was talking about. Way too many sharp edges. Um, maybe this implant here, not quite supported. So those are all things we need to somehow fill in. So if I go to and smoothen out, if I go to add remove, I'd smoothen all of these areas, build some material up here and maybe you see this, this is like a um, typical dirt trap. So you want to fill that material in and smoothen that out. Make it, um, make it round, make it not super convex, but not, not as concave as, as it is right now. That would definitely attract things and the least you have to do is all uh, smoothen around those. Okay. And then if you're getting your scan data in, you basically want to at least create a little bit of a pressure on, on the ridge. And that's, I don't measure that. I do that by, by eye. Okay. Uh, but there has to be there has to be some pressure on the on the soft tissue. And 
And again, around those here, this is a, is a bit of a dark trap. So uh, trying to, again, reduce the, this, this flange, what we have here, but I can only, and every case will have its other set of issues, reduce it so much because this is where my implant is. And I want to have some minimum thickness that it's not going to break on the little point. And these sharp edges, and then you can reduce again what I said that footprint, and and have it have it a very small as small as you can footprint to the tissue. Um, with the thickness, what you need in mind, and with um, obviously if you if you need to be on a certain place, and then um, it eventually has to become a thicker thing. But the thicker it is, the more it might eventually attract and you shouldn't you shouldn't wrap around the ridge is what i'm trying to say okay and then ultimately um close this and load another scene file ultimately we we uh i will take a peek at the final and i will switch my dongle over and show you the nesting portion of this, yeah? because I think it's already 513 and uh, I think you guys probably want to see the, the nesting of it. Okay. So of course, we could design a model here. Um, the library, what Enzo is providing, does have a model builder library in there. Um, so you, you could do that. Um, of course, you have to have a decent printer if you want to do that. I think you already know that. Um, I probably wouldn't try printing an, an implant model on the entry level printers, it's just not going to work out. It's going to ask for trouble. And you want to you have a, a good quality printer if you're doing that. Otherwise, I would revert to a traditional uh, open tray impression, pickup uh, impression, um, and do a traditional model. OK, so again, there's areas where I probably would touch up with a hand piece after it's milled. I'd probably rework a couple of things. You have to also set your expectations to the mill um, right. Even if there is a five axis uh, strategy, there's usually always some things what I'm ending up touching up before I'm putting that in the center furnace. Um, but I will show you at least a couple of things like how you increase the diameter and the, and the nesting, et cetera, so that you can have a better chance of su a successful milling and a, and a good milling job. And I will show you a couple of tricks on how the stabilizer is being created. Okay. Then um, let me close this here. Let me switch my dongle over. And I'll go to my nesting software. And I'll grab that file. So if you are sending files back and forth, um, I want to remind you that the STL file by itself is only half the information you want to have as well the construction info file when you're sending files back and forth and you want to stay away from uh, renaming the file. Okay, because the name of the file is inside of the construction info, they are linked together. As soon as you're renaming one of them, you're breaking that link and uh, you are going to have to redefine things. Sometimes uh, we're doing that on purpose. If something doesn't nest and maybe something was wrong in the definitions or something, and we're doing what's called the raw SDL file import. Um, but in this case, uh, try to not rename things. Okay, I think I actually have one here what I can load. And that may not be, it's a bit of a different design here in this case. Yeah. Um, but you see the same, the same story, smooth and um, thick enough 
but with a with a small footprint. Okay. And if we are positioning this in the blank, we have this outline here where if we right click the construction, this should be set to at least six millimeters. And in my case, that I think I already changed that. Um, that will do a couple of things for you. That will give you more room around your buckle and, and vestibule area um, to have more space for the burrs, for the mill to go there. Otherwise, it, if there's not enough space, if this is too tight, you might look at calculation errors. You might look into areas which the five axis strategy can maybe not efficiently reach. And on before we're doing really much of anything, uh, I would increase that space to six millimeter, if not eight. And then uh, I would also have a side view, uh, depending if you have a multi-layer case. In my case, it says right here, this is a solid Gen X puck. So this is multi-layered. So what are we gonna do first? We're gonna unlock the inclination here and we're gonna hold control and we're straightening this out and we're having the same um, OMA and value uh, on the correct places that we're not having suddenly one central lighter than the other one is. Okay, and then we can position this. Richard, can I can I ask yes. you something? I'm you sure. being a hundred percent open here. Yeah. Um, when you see that uh, the angle there, it's uh, it's gone up over twenty degrees there. Yes, that would be the maximum what I what I would feel comf comfortable with. Yes, yeah, that's what I was gonna I was gonna ask because that we usually uh, tell customers to always try to work under twenty. Yes, um, but you can when you lock the inclination, you can affect the angle if you're rotating it in the blank now. So you see now it's twenty. Um, mm, okay. Twenty-three. Oh, okay. So, okay. so so just the the tilting. Um, alone um, does change the angle, but I can get this down to 16, um, okay. 17 in this case right now. So that's that's awesome. Um, 21 or anything above 20 is 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 a bit of a, of a risk because you uh, your machine supports 30 degree maximum, and you might end up uh, seeing calculation error uh, or it, it's getting a little um, tricky with the higher angles that uh, that's part of the reason why you're increasing the space that you're hopefully not breaking a burrow or something like that. Okay. Okay. Um, then once it's, once it's placed, we can say change connectors. Um, Richard, do you mind, <clears throat> I don't know if you, if you were going to do that uh, afterwards or not, but um, do you mind if we took, take a look at the margins and how they are set there? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think it's important for. Uh, I think the idea would be to go on uh, the on design parameters there. On a right click and then design parameters. You know what I'm talking about? Mm. I think it's the very last option there. Yeah. And what did you want to show here? No, I just want to uh, just want to make sure that everybody gets clear. OK, so uh, whenever you're importing with the construction info already done, uh, this is all going to be set. OK, but uh, I always recommend taking a second look, especially if you're designing with uh, with anything different from uh, Ceramil Mind. And ExoCAD works most of the time, but sometimes the when you import, it comes with the margin set a little bit different, right? So uh, if you could just turn it around, Richard, please. So um, I'm gonna talk about pink line, yellow line, and blue line. Pink line is the emergency profile there, right? right. The yellow line is the implant boundary. I think that's how it's called, right? And uh, one thing that's really important, this line, the yellow line, implant boundary, it has to be on the most external part of the connection, right? Basically, what we can think of is um, the software is going to kind of understand 
anything that's inside that line as a connection. So it's going to use the flat burst to mill everything that's inside that line. Okay. And the very last line, which is the upper screw channel boundary. This is where we see many of the issues they come, uh, they happen because of this third line there. You guys see how it is set right on the interface between the screw seating and the screw channel wall there. It has always to be there, right? It cannot be all the way up. It cannot be in the middle. It has to be all the way down on the screw seating, right? If you do it, uh, if you do it a little higher, the screw seating is going to sit higher and you're not going to be able to pass the screw all the way down, right? So that's how you identify uh, you identify that you had an issue with the screw seating. I'm just saying that just has you to go over that because this is the most common uh, mistake that we see users doing. Perfect. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Yep. And if you, let's say, it would be usually ExoCAD and, and um, the Match 2 should work fine, but there's a couple yeah. things to, to know about it. You should probably then, if you're using GenX, use the, uh, the work params from Amman Gerbach. Uh, Etc. Um, but let's say you you were using three shape to design these, and you're you're gonna have to import and define those things, and then you should know definitely where they where they're supposed to be. Exactly. Okay. Um, let me close this, and let's do uh, a quick um, stabilizer here. The trick on the on the stabilizer would basically be that we're maybe creating some very posterior ones, even though they may not stay there, uh, just for the creation of the stabilizer. And um, in the beginning, like ten years ago, or whatever, um, we would uh, tell people make like ten of those support pins. That's crazy, even thinking about it. Um, I think everybody changed their opinion about it. Less is more. First off, you don't have to cut through all of those. And then also, if there's too many, they, it might actually be counterproductive. So you might get more warpage in it. Um, I think the stabilizer is important. Um, although I see some people are claiming that they're having good results without any stabilizers. I think that's a little crazy. Um, I would always create one. Um, I haven't seen those things with my own eyes um, from these people which are having good results with it. So I don't know what the other magic might be, but I have seen uh, when I worked at supported AG, uh, plenty of cases which have warped because there was no stabilizer. Um, so I would create one and I would probably do somewhat in between four and six connectors connecting to the stabilizer. Um, and I'm only creating those posterior ones here in the beginning uh, until the stabilizer is created. And I would also try to stay away, don't place like a stabilizer directly to the implant. Maybe put that, if you need one here, put that in between or put it next to it somewhere. Um, so let's say there's one, two, three, four, and then maybe we create uh, another one over here there and they also should always always be on the same level and be pointing in the same direction kind of with the exception of these two i'm going to delete those okay um, but basically if you're looking from this view here you kind of want to have them more or less level and not go in one like this and the other one like that that would be bad uh, you want to have them pointing in the same uh, plane. And again, these ones I'm ignoring right now. And there's on, on these ones, there's no uh, pre-cut as of right now. I'm only going to create a pre-cut on the outside ones. Now, if you want for milling support more in here, you can do that and then let the machine cut them off with 100%. But I'm going to right click the restoration right now and I'm going to say create stabilizer. And these posterior ones are hopefully going to help me creating a bigger stabilizer. And I was actually too big. <laughs> OK. 
okay. So if I if I get rid of this and I'm going to say create stabilizer, it should make this smaller. One. Let's see. Let's say I'm moving this one here a little bit. Stabilizer. You see now it's smaller. You can also nest something inside of it. And I think I'm actually going to try and, and just see what happens if I'm creating like this. And you basically need to play around with the connectors and, and see what is creating a decent stabilizer shape for you um, that, that uh, satisfies you. And if you place them far enough posterior and, and you're, you're playing around with this long enough, you can basically make yourself a that's quite often requested as is that that T bar stabilizer which uh, used to be in the software and had to be taken out. Um, you can leave these thick connectors on you take a disc uh, and cut from here over to here and then you're basically ending up with a T at the end. And then it's manual work and you have a bit of a work around. Um, Okay, so that's roughly the idea. Of course, you would create some connectors on the exterior, but I think we already know that. I'll probably leave, try to leave the the interiors um, uh, if you, if you can, more or less uh, untouched. So place them on a, on a portion of the restoration where it's maybe not uh, that crucial, and maybe make a cutoff either fifty percent or what you can do. Let's say you have a couple of 50%. You can have the machine now, if you don't have a cutoff, you can right click and you can say cutoff connect and then the machine actually makes a 100% cutoff at the anatomy. And you have less work to do. And like that. Okay, roughly like that. And then you could uh, ultimately, this might maybe be something what I would approve upon, but I wanna show you the uh, strategies here. Sorry, that popped up on a different window. And this is where it's getting interesting. You normally don't have these options here. So you would now pick interface or interface HD. And maybe, uh, Enzo, you can explain the differences here a little bit better. All right. So um, basically, you have three options. You have TI Connect, you have an inter interface, and you have interface HD. If you take a look there, you're going to have actually five options. But uh, the interface and interface HD on the bottom are if you are using the new RFID burst from AG, which I think pretty much everyone now is using those. But if you have the older ones, you know, the ones that didn't come uh, with the RFID, you're going to choose the one of the two strategies on top. Okay. Now going for the difference between those three, uh, those three st strategies. TI Connect is the standard strategy from AG, meaning you're not using the flat burst for anything, right? Interface and Interface HD, they are both using the, the flat burst to mill the connection and to mill the screw channel. The difference between them is that on the Interface HD one, you're having the 0.3 millimeter HD bird doing a final detailing on the connection, right? That's the only difference there between the interface and interface HD is there. It's not going to change anything on the screw channel. It's not going to change anything on the, the whole construction. It's only on the connection where you're going to have an extra step, extra milling step, which is the 0.3 HD doing a detailing on the connection. That's pretty much it. It's that simple. All right. 
Um, and Richard, if you don't mind, I think uh, one thing that I'd like to mention is uh, on the abutment fit option. Um, I don't know if it's clear to everyone or not, but the abutment fit option is the option that you're going to make the connection um, a little tighter or a little looser, let's call it bigger or smaller, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I always recommend is uh, at least at least once a week, run one test case to see where your machine is, right? So from a baseline, you should be able to work with standard, right? But we know some machines have different calibrations. You might be getting closer to a, I don't know, a thousand hours uh, maintenance and you, you need to do a calibration or not. Even if you have a medic, sometimes it's get, when it gets close, it gets a little bit off. So you're gonna have to make an adjustment there. So that's why we, we always say mill a scan body, mill one small crown using one library that you, that you already know and test it on the analog, okay? So you find the best fitting before you run the big cases. So you don't put a, a whole zirconia disc at risk just because you don't wanna run one small, one small crown, right? So those are good practices that we always recommend people working with when, they, when they're going within CADCAM. Right. And when you're saying a test case, then, then uh, are you saying a, a calibration of the of the machine, or or no, 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 just check out to see how how it fits. Yeah, see how it fits. Yeah. Right. So mill one. Let's say a scan body, right? Mill the scan body on standard, right? Yeah. Put it on the on the analog. You see, it's a little uh, a little tight. So you go on plus ten. Mill it again. Okay, it's a little better, but it's still too tight. Go on plus twenty. Okay, now if it's okay, so now you're gonna use plus 20 for all of your cases that, uh, for this week, for example, right? And the, the two liberations also something to keep in mind. I'm not gonna tell you to use old burrs, but you can definitely tell the fit changes with a brand new burr versus of some course. burr which has 80% on it. Uh, and it's, it's like almost through the, the cycle. So you can adjust all that here. That's nice to have. Exactly, exactly. And then so last but not least, um, undercuts. Of, of course, this is automatically now on fine. Um, I think fine is, is for me is usually enough. Um, HD is just this, this, the same like here on the tie connect. The difference in between uh, the smaller burrs on, on HD that would be using the 0.3 burr versus the 0.6 burr uh, to get to the, uh, to the undercuts. But um, I, I'm usually touching things up anyways with the handpiece and uh, putting some texture on it. You're, you're having it in your hand to cut off the connectors anyways on the on the buckle side. Excuse me, the facial side. And um, yeah, so one of those options has to be on there. In, in some cases, like on a crown and bridge, that's not by default enabled. So you, you, have, to, you have to think about it if you need it or not. Um, Fissure, same same story. I think standard is good unless you have something really defined, lots of secondary anatomy in there. You can turn that to HD for the smaller burr. Okay, then you stop calculation and then you're halfway through it. And you now have to only uh, finish it at the end and then clean it well and uh, put some some pink liquid on there in the case of a Gen X uh, to get the, the tissue um, precinct or stained and then finish it up at the at the end. All right, do you, do you have anything to add, Enzo? Um, do we have any questions maybe? Um, yeah, I see you already actually put that in the chat here. If there is questions, so let us know, that's awesome. Yeah, um, no, on my end, I think we've covered everything. Um, what I really like about the, the idea behind InkitCam is that it's all integrated in the software. So you don't have a different software to do that. You don't have a different thing that you have to open. You yep. are working inside your usual workflow. And if you think about it on the very end is there is where you're actually choosing the strategy, right? So this is basically um, a one button difference. We know it's not only one button, but if you think on the whole process, it's, uh, it's only on the very last option. That you're gonna that you're gonna select the strategy, and uh, one thing that's cool, uh, I don't think we need to show it here, but it's just cool to know is that 
uh, whenever you choose either interface or interface HD, uh, when you send the case to Ceramil Move or to Ceramil Motion, I think it's more on Ceramil Move, it's going to, uh, it's going to ask, ask uh, it's going to tell you the burrs you need. So it's going to ask you for the 1.5. It's going to ask you for the 1.2. It's going to ask you for the, the 0 0.6. Yep. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, on my end, uh, again, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Opulent, for the opportunity. Um, if you guys have any further questions regarding NCAD CAM and uh, you don't want to take those questions now, you want to take them um, another day during next week or whatever, um, Opulent has my number so you guys can ask directly to them and uh, they're going to put you guys in contact with me. And um, feel free to contact me anytime, basically. <laughs> exactly, perfect. So I, I'm giving you my email address here as well if there's uh, follow-up questions which haven't come through here. And uh, of course, um, a case like this, uh, I don't know, I, I don't even want to put a number on it and how long that is taking in design or should take in design. But uh, if you need training on it or follow up, so uh, feel free to reach out, and uh, we can we can help you at Opulent and set something up. And there's already customers I want to point that out using in CAD CAM in the in the US, and they're successful with it, and uh, they all somehow managed learning how to do it. So it's not uh, maybe the easiest things of the trade, but it's also not rocket science. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's achievable um, for certain, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to assist you through it. All right, guys, then um, thanks to all of you joining and, and watching. I hope it was uh, interesting and uh, something, you, something new what you could maybe pick up and uh, have a great weekend. Enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully talk to you soon and see you soon. Bye. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you.